Welcome everyone to this video presentation featuring uh, Father Kreshti's book, The Church of God in Jesus Christ, looking at his chapters 15 and 16 on renewal and reformation, as well as chapter 16 on the eschatological consummation of the church. And in this video, I'm going to enlist the help of another book you might be familiar with, uh, Cardinal Avery Dulles' book called Models of the Church. Just one chapter out of this book, um, chapter 7, The Church and Eschatology, uh, just to further unpack the meaning of the relationship between ecclesiology and eschatology, uh, two mouthfuls of words with the same ending, the same suffix, ology, based on the Greek word logos, uh, which is a very significant word for Christian theology. St. John uses it in the beginning of his gospel. In the beginning was the logos, and the logos was with God, and the logos was God. All things came to be through him, and without him nothing came to be. And in verse 14, and the logos became flesh and dwelt among us. And so we translate this in most English translation as in the beginning was the word. Uh, but logos means so much, so much more than word. Word is kind of a generic uh, translation of it, but still significant. Um, but thinking about ecclesiology, the logos of ecclesia, the church, and the logos of uh, eschatology, Escata, the last things, death, judgment, heaven, hell, uh, purgatory, and route to heaven. Um, but I'm going to rely on Avery Dulles, especially in this video, um, unpacking these themes of um, ecclesiology and eschatology. <clears throat> but first, I want to just feature a quote from Pareshti, page 224. One of my favorite lines in this whole book, really. I just love this line. It's kind of tattoo-worthy, you could say. <laughs> uh, I don't have any tattoos, but um, if I were to get one... <laughs> it's one of those things that is just um, classic uh, textbook um, in Catholic theology. The Latin phrase, Tunditur non submergitur. I just quoted this to my daughter the other day, just thinking about uh, the church and our confidence we have in Christ and his church and um, and how we can think about our own lives this applies to. Tunditur non submergitur. Tossed about, uh, undergoing a lot of turbulence, but not submerged in the water. Undergoing all kinds of things, but not... Uh, submerged, not um, all is lost. And so this is a famous patristic statement in reference to the boat of St. Peter, which is the church, tossed about but does not submerge. I just love that so much. And in the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 16, when Jesus gives Simon the name in Aramaic, Kepha, in Greek, Petros, New Testament, Greek, and then uh, in English we say Peter. His name was Simon, but Jesus called him Kepha in Aramaic, which means rock. And, and because Jesus said, on this rock I will build my church. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. Again, very interesting. In the, in the uh, four Gospels, the word church occurs only twice. Both in the Gospel of St. Matthew. One right there. Uh, on the lips of Jesus. Um, Upon this rock I will build my church. And then another later in the Gospel... Uh, also with reference to St. Peter, how he needs to strengthen uh, the brethren, strengthen uh, his uh, fellow uh, bishops in the early church. And uh, so 
It's, it's very curious. Um, of course, in the rest of the New Testament, we have the word church many times, especially in Acts of the Apostles, the sequel to Luke's Gospel, um, and uh, throughout all the other letters of the New Testament. But um, this phrase, tossed about but not submerged, the gates of hell will not prevail against this church. And so it's an image of the church not on the defensive, but on the offensive even. It's not that the church just needs to protect herself from all the bad things out there, but that the church is meant to be in the world as a catalyst of conversion, as a driving force of meaning and purpose in people's lives, the ultimate meaning and purpose. This is the church of the Logos, after all. Um, and uh, so... This line of Christ is just wonderful. And all the way to the end, tossed about but not submerged. Um, so now I want to just take a turn into this book by Cardinal Avery Dulles, Models of the Church. Again, chapter 7 in this book, The Church and Eschatology. Um, so it's... Um, St. John Henry says, uh, the church changes in order to stay the same. And we talk. he also talks about the development of doctrine within the church. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's a dialectic um, between, um, you could say, uh, stability, uh, you know, that which does not change, but then that which does change uh, to maintain that which does not change. It's a paradox here, a very important paradox. And when we think about eschatology, this, this theological um, field of study that concentrates on what happens after death, uh, this is it's eschatology. And as we're en route as the pilgrim church, to our final destination, we can have this confidence that we're going to be tossed about but not submerged. And both Koreshti and Dulles are, we could say, uh, theologians very attuned to the Second Vatican Council and all the reform and renewal that's happening there. And we see in the document of the Second Vatican Council, Lumen Gentium, Lumen Gentium, uh, chapter 7 also, that we have the eschatological nature of the pilgrim church and its union with the church in heaven. So this is a great text here, and we can see all the various models Avery Dulles talks about in his book showing up here uh, in this treatment of the church and eschatology. And of course, the crowning chapter of Lumen Gentium on the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, in the mystery of Christ in the Church. Uh, but for now, we're concentrating on this section right here. So for this video, I really would love to just read through every paragraph of section uh, 48, 49, 50, 51 of Lumen Gentium and unpack what's here. But that would probably take at least three hours for me to do that. So I'm not going to do that. But I encourage you just to read this. Uh, also, as we continue to read the full uh, document, Lumen Gentium. That's what we're talking about here with Koreshti. Uh, is chapter 16. And uh, with some help here from the, this Dulles book about um, uh, what's going on here. So I'm going to quote from the Dulles book, and um, again, you could refer to this, uh, chapter 7, um, and also Lumen Gentium here, chapter 7. Okay, so in Dulles, we want to look at what, what is he saying, and how does he help us understand what Koreshti is saying. I think this Dulles text just gets into some more interesting details uh, that... Um, uh, takes the crash deep material further. So within just a few minutes, I want to highlight some points. So um, we understand 
that uh, as followers of Christ, the Messianic age is upon us. The Messiah has come. His name is Jesus. And we are approaching what's called in Greek, parousia, a very key theological term, parousia. Uh, and I want to just write that out for you here. So the Greek term, parousia. It's a very key term thinking about eschatology. Parousia, uh, the word usia in Greek means uh, substance or being. And par is something that's near. It's right here. It's, it's nearby, next to you. Parousia can be translated as presence, in a word, presence. And, but what parousia means in relation to eschatology is the second coming of Christ. His presence, his definitive presence among us, with us, uh, in that final judgment to take place, where God will be all in all. Parousia, a biblical term. Uh, and it's that the messianic age uh, is tethered to this parousia. It's incomplete until parousia. So also what parousia means, therefore, is is there something that has come already? The advent of Christ, most definitely, his paschal mystery in full effect, his church in full effect, the sacraments in full effect. But there's something that is not yet, even with all that has happened. We live in this in-between time, the messianic age, uh, in which there's so much that is already happened in Christ and been given in Christ everything to the point of abandonment without remainder and yet we wait for the ultimate consummation of this theodrama another beautiful term from 20th century Swiss Catholic theologian Hansers von Balthasar the theodrama that has taken place God's drama God's uh, saving acts within human history within this order of creation and this little planet Earth within this vast expanding universe is where all the drama took place. Um, and through Einstein's theory of relativity, it doesn't really make a difference um, that our planet is so small in relation to the biggest stars and, and everything, all these galaxies. Uh, but it took place somewhere, and that somewhere is here. So uh, then Dulles goes on to say that though we're living now in, when he, uh, he quotes um, a theologian, uh, Albert Schweitzer, who's a prominent, uh, I believe Protestant theologian of the 20th century. And the Protestant theologians were very much more attuned to eschatology, uh, generally speaking, than the Catholic ones in the 20th century uh, because of their emphasis on proclamation and promises of God uh, and um, um, this sense of, of word and kind of like always pointing to the fulfillment of the promises of God. But even Protestant theologian Albert Schweitzer uh, talks about um, this experience of nearly two millennia of the delayed parousia, the delayed second coming of Christ, makes eschatological expectation impossible for us today. So in the early church, we see this in the writings of St. Paul, for example, there was an imminent expectation as if Jesus is going to come back any time, any second, any day, and so everybody just needs to be ready. But now 2,000 years have gone by and he hasn't come back yet. So it's a different kind of feel about the second coming when uh, we probably approach most of our days um, not expecting it to happen. <laughs> um, at the same time, as Jesus says, be ready, be vigilant. You don't know the day or the hour. Uh, and and so um, this also applies to our death too, actually. Um, this, this consummation of our lives happens when we die. That's our testament there. That's, that's all she wrote. <laughs> um, when we die. 
So we have to be ready, therefore, in relation to our death, which is then something, yeah. Um, we don't know when that's going to happen, and it could happen anytime. So we have to be ready and vigilant. So the experience of death and the meaning of parousia, closely related here. Even if uh, we don't have the same kind of imminent expectation as um, the early church. So... Um, Finally, just a couple more points with Dulles. He talks about these five models of the church, the church as institution, the church as mystical communion, the church as sacrament, the church as herald, the evangelizing, proclaiming church, and the church as servant. So um, this third model of the church as sacrament, we might wonder... In the life to come, uh, what happens with sacraments? Uh, will there be a sacramental life in heaven in the sense that the life of grace will be expressed and communicated by b visible embodiments? And Dulles uh, entertains this possibility and says that uh, man's experience of God in heaven will presumably be expressed through a whole network of tangible and social signs. And the sum total of these signs will constitute the heavenly church as sacrament. Unless this were true, the life of glory could hardly be a true communion of saints, and the resurrection of the body would scarcely be intelligible. So thinking about um, the extension of the sacramental mysteries, the sacramentality of our being in the life to come is um, quite essential to think about because um, there's something sacramental about our bodies, uh, about the risen body of Christ, the full human nature of Christ's body and soul, of the human nature of his blessed mother Mary and her glorious assumption into heaven. Um, uh, and so... These are some points from Dulles that um, we can think about with uh, the other models of the church, especially Harold and Servant, that uh, especially Harold that really does a good job of anticipating uh, this life to come and this, we could say, dialectical interplay in the meantime that takes us from the, uh, this in-between time where we experience the already but not yet, mm -hmm. And in this sense, thinking about the church as herald, thinking about the power of proclamation within the church uh, in an adequate eschatological view, the theology of the word of proclamation should be combined with a sacramental view and with an understanding of the mission of the church to the larger human community as pointed up in the servant model of the church. So we have a kind of um, um, three parts thing happening here, and I just want to try to uh, draw this if I can. Um, if I'm able to to draw here, okay, okay. So uh, we can think of this as as something like a. Uh, Something like a trinity of relationships here. All right, so I just want to, to draw then what's being meant here. Uh, and that is three things. We have the sacraments. We have scripture. And we have... Um, the ethical life, church as servant. So I'm abbreviating these words. And we have the interplay between the three of them. Church as sacrament, church as herald, church as servant. And of course we have the church as institution and mystical communion as well. But think of the interplay of these elements. There's a um, liturgical sacramental theologian from France, Louis-Marie Chauvet, 
in his book, The Sacraments, talks about this relationship, this dialectical relationship that sees us through this living in this time of the already, but not yet. Um, so these are some takeaway points uh, from both Koreshti is, is alluding to these things, and this Dulles book also helps us unpack that careful relationship between ecclesiology and eschatology in which heaven is not earth and we don't want to um, confuse the two um, our permanent address our permanent place of residence is not here uh, and we can take it as kind of good news and bad news in the sense of where is it then if it's not uh, on Google Maps but it's somewhere other than here but it involves uh, a transfiguration of this entire order of creation the resurrection of the body reunification of resurrected bodies and, and souls um, and this movement toward parousia in which God will be all in all